Hello, and welcome to BD's first fiscal quarter 2021 earnings call. At the request of BD, today's call is being recorded. It will be available for replay through February 11, 2021 on the investors page of the BD.com website or by phone at 855-859-2056 for domestic calls and area code 404 537 3406 for international calls using confirmation number 6993448. I would like to inform all parties that your lines have been placed in a listen only mode until the question and answer segment. Beginning today's call is Ms. Kristen Stewart, Senior Vice President of Strategy and Investor Relations. Ms. Stewart, you may begin. Thanks, Stephanie, and welcome to BD's review of our first fiscal quarter results. Joining me today, we have Tom Poland, Chief Executive Officer and President, Chris Reedy, Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and Chief Administrative Officer. During the Q&A portion of the call, we will have our three segment presidents joining us as well, Alberto Moss, President of the Medical Segment, Dave Hickey, President of the Life Sciences Segment, and Simon Campion, President of the Interventional Segment. A few logistics before we get into the call. This call is being made available via webcast at bd.com, where you can also find the accompanying slides for today's uh, call. During the call, we will be making some forward-looking statements, and it is possible that risks um, could differ, sorry, actual results could differ from our expectations. Risks, uncertainties, and other factors that could cause such differences can be found in our earnings release and in our SEC filings, including our 2020 Form 10-K and subsequent Form 10-Qs. In particular, there continues to be significant uncertainties about the duration and contemplated impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. This commentary we are providing today includes our best estimate based upon the information that we currently have. We have made certain assumptions in how we are managing our business, but that could change as we move forward. We will also be discussing some non-GAAP financial measures with respect to our performance. The reconciliations to GAAP measures that include the details of purchase accounting and other adjustments can be found in our press release and its related financial schedules in the appendix of the investor relations slides. These are also available on the BD.com website. Unless otherwise specified, all comparisons will be on a year-over-year basis versus fiscal 2020. When we discuss revenue percent changes, they are on an FX neutral basis, unless otherwise noted. With all that said, it is my pleasure to turn it over to BD's CEO and President, Tom Poland. Tom? Thank you, Kristen, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We are very pleased with our Q1 results, which were ahead of our expectations, reflecting the tremendous efforts and execution of BD's 70,000 associates the essential role of our products and solutions in healthcare, and the greater resiliency of the healthcare system in treating both COVID and non-COVID patients. While our fiscal year has just started, I'm proud of the team for the momentum we are building and their dedication to our purpose of advancing the world of health. Revenues increased 25.8% on a reported basis, or 24.3% on an FX neutral basis, with 20.3 percentage points of growth coming from our COVID-19 diagnostic revenues. While we did see some benefits from timing in the quarter, we were very pleased with the performance of the base business, which was up 4% against the backdrop of COVID resurgences around the world. We are seeing the early benefits of some of the actions we have taken to drive our base performance. Our adjusted EPS were $4.55, or up 72% versus the prior year. This was also well above our expectations as a result of three factors. First, our revenues came in above our plan, driven by higher acuity, driving increased demand, greater resiliency in procedural volumes, and exceptional execution in COVID diagnostics. Second, we benefited from favorable product mix, like Veritor, but also from our higher acuity products. Third, our investment spending, such as in R&D, was lighter and earlier in ramping. So as you can see, We started this year with strong momentum, and that is despite the COVID resurgence. We did start to see some impact of the resurgence on our more elective procedure-related businesses late in December, and that continued into January. However, 
we are feeling more confident in the resiliency of our base business relative to what we saw early on in the pandemic. While the healthcare markets continue to be dynamic with COVID-19, and there are a number of moving parts, the momentum within BD and our conviction in our strategy lead us to raise our financial guidance for fiscal 2021. Our focus is not only on fulfilling our near-term commitments, but also on advancing our strategy and creating value for our shareholders over the longer term. And I'm feeling even greater confidence with the progress the BD team is making in advancing the BD 2025, grow, simplify, and empower initiatives, and our ability to create substantial shareholder value. Today, I wanna to focus my remarks on three key topics, and then I'll turn it over to Chris, who will provide additional remarks on our quarter's performance and comment on our outlook. Then we'll take your questions. So let's jump right in. First, let me start with the Alaris remediation and our overall quality and compliance initiatives. Alaris remediation has and continues to be my number one priority, and the team is making strong progress. Our focus remains on submitting a comprehensive 510K filing for the Alaris system, and we remain on track to submit it in late fiscal Q2 or early fiscal Q3 2021. We also continue to make progress on executing our holistic Inspire quality initiatives throughout the organization. Second, as you know, we have a very strong focus on growth and ensuring a durable mid-single-digit revenue growth profile. So let me share some of the exciting highlights in our pipeline and other growth initiatives. We continue to increase our investments and strengthen our pipeline across three innovation themes that leverage our core strengths. First, we're applying smart devices, robotics, analytics, and AI to improve care processes. Second, we're enabling new care settings to enhance patient experience and lower costs. And this includes investing in products designed for use in the home markets and in sales channels to support these patients. And third, <clears throat> we're investing to improve diagnosis and treatment of chronic disease. So in line with these innovation and investment priorities, in Q1, we acquired the medical assets of Cubex, which expands our medication management offering by combining a cloud-based, easy-to-deploy analytics platform with a smart tabletop dispensing device to create solutions for the fast-growing non-acute care market. This extends our medication management solution from the hospital into the long-term care, surgery centers, and other non-acute locations. Another smart device we plan on launching this quarter is the Sensica Automated Urine Output System, which leverages BD's leading position in acute urology, along with BD's broad EMR interoperability capabilities and install base. Also within BD Interventional, the BD PureWick Urine Collection System and catheter continues to be a significant driver of growth for our urology and critical care business. PureWick is a female external urinary catheter and urine collection system that we sell into the acute care and long-term care settings but we're now actively extending that directly to patients with our new PureWick dry dock system for the home. And this launch is exceeding our expectations and in fact, PureWick revenues now exceed Lutonix. An exciting launch later this year designed to improve the diagnosis and treatment of cervical cancer is the US launch of our new BD core with our BD on Clarity HPV assay with extended genotyping. With BD core, BD is gonna enter the high throughput molecular testing market with a very unique, fully automated sample to answer platform and a highly differentiated assay with unique claims that can improve risk, risk stratification and support risk-based patient management. The system has been CE marked and has been very well received by our customers during our launch in Europe. These are just a few of the many products in our pipeline and you can find further details on our new innovations in the supplemental earnings presentation posted to our website. As we've, as we've previously shared, we're investing a portion of our Veritor profits to advance our BD 2025 strategy. We expanded the size of the BD Innovation and Growth Fund, and additional innovation projects are being initiated on a rolling basis. We are investing to accelerate our simplification initiatives, including Recode, and enhancing our quality and compliance programs. We're also increasing funding in our BD University, to support advanced employee education and leadership development as part of our strategy. As we always do with our spending, we're taking a disciplined approach <clears throat> and the timing of the spending was lighter in Q1. And we expect it to step up in Q2 and remain higher for the balance of the fiscal year. 
As we've mentioned before, we continue to actively evaluate tuck-in acquisitions to supplement our growth strategy. And we executed on three strategic tuck-ins transactions so far this year, including Cubex's medical assets that I mentioned earlier. We continue to apply a disciplined financial and strategic evaluation process to these transactions and have a robust funnel. Lastly, I'd like to update you on our COVID diagnostics outlook and specifically Veritor. Antigen testing continues to become more widely used in both traditional and non-traditional settings. We have been highly successful with our BD Veritor Plus COVID-19 launch. Veritor has been well received for the ease of use, performance, and automated digital data and informatics capabilities that are provided with our handheld platform. We've nearly tripled our active reader base since the pandemic and now have more than 70,000 BD Veritor analyzers globally which we intend to leverage in the future with planned non-COVID menu expansion, which we've already begun investing behind. As previously shared, we continue to make good progress on advancing new COVID diagnostics in our pipeline, including combination flu AB and COVID-19 assays on both BD Max and Veritor. We also continue to explore home testing on BD Veritor, and has been our practice, we'll provide updates to these programs upon launch. Turning to the quarter's performance, our Q1 COVID-19 diagnostics revenues were higher than we expected at $867 million, which included better than expected BD Veritor rapid point of care antigen test revenues of $688 million and higher BD Max COVID assays and collection swabs and transport devices. The higher than expected Veritor revenues were the result of our ability to scale our manufacturing faster which is a testament to our manufacturing excellence, as well as realizing higher pricing than we anticipated. However, since we've been saying since last fall, we do expect pricing to move lower as capacity came online, and this is what's playing out. We recently lowered our pricing to allow the broadest patient access to our best-in-class BD Veritor Plus system. We believe this price adjustment is in the best interest of our customers and patients around the world as we've now ramped our manufacturing capacity and there are emerging mutations that are making it more transmissible. We also believe this is in the best interest of our shareholders as we believe this move allows us to maintain a leadership position in the point of care market. With respect to our fiscal 2021 Veritor revenue guidance, as we've been discussing, there continues to be many variables at play besides the evolving pricing environment including the rollout and adoption of vaccines and the circulation of new COVID variants. It's also difficult to pinpoint when the market supply for antigen tests will exceed market demand. For modeling purposes, we would suggest using an ASP in the low to mid teens. Given all this, we expect Veritor revenues to be toward the high end of our previous range of $1 to $1.5 billion. We continue to expect Veritor revenues to be more weighted to the first half of our fiscal year and given the evolving pricing and capacity environment, we would expect our fiscal Q2 revenues to be lower than our just reported Q1 results. Before turning it over to Chris to review the financials, I want to close with a few thoughts. While we were very pleased with the performance of Veritor and other COVID diagnostic revenues in the quarter, what excites us more was the improving momentum and resiliency of the base business. While we saw some headwinds in our procedure-based businesses from the resurgence late in December and that continued into January, the impact was much more limited than at the start of the pandemic. Moreover, given the momentum in our base business, the investments we were making, and our BD 2025 strategy, we believe we are positioned to emerge strong. We remain on track to submit our Alaris 510K filing in late fiscal Q2 or early Q3, and we're making great progress in advancing our BD 2025 strategy. And I'm particularly pleased with the investment programs we've identified and initiated. These investments allow us to further fulfill our purpose of advancing the world of health, bring new innovations to patients and expand access. Increased spending will be more evident in our P&L later in this fiscal year, but we believe these initiatives will translate into revenue accretion beginning in late FY22 and beyond. The investments we are making are also towards simplification initiatives, which reduce complexities, drive cost efficiencies, enhance our quality programs, and improve cash flows. This quarter, we made several advancements on this front, 
including inventory reductions that we absorbed in our gross margin in the quarter that helped to strengthen our cash flows. Our recode efforts are on track to achieve our targeted $300 million in cost savings by the end of fiscal 2024. We're also advancing our sustainability initiatives because we view sustainability as a strategic imperative. And we recently announced the first of our 2030 and beyond goals, our climate change targets. We're committed to reducing scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions 46% by 2030 and to be carbon neutral across direct operations by 2040. This science-based target is aligned with the 1.5 degree C global emissions reduction pathway. And we look forward to sharing more detail behind our 2030 sustainability plan with you in future engagements. And finally, I'm very proud of the organization for being named for four consecutive years to the Human Rights Campaign's Foundation's Best Place to Work for LGBTQ Equality List and for the second straight year to the Gender Equality Index. Inclusion and diversity is an important focus for BD as we continue to attract, develop, and retain the best talent as well as benefit from diversity of background and thought. I look forward to answering your questions during the Q&A portion of this call, and I'll turn it over to Chris now. Thanks, Tom, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We are very pleased with our, our fiscal first quarter revenue and adjusted earnings per share performance, both of which exceeded our expectations. Total revenues were over $5.3 billion in line with our January 12th pre-announcement. Revenues increased 25.8% on a reported basis and 24.3% on an FX neutral basis. COVID-19 diagnostic revenues accounted for 20.3 percentage points of growth. The better than expected performance came from three areas. First, our base business performed better than expected. This was a result of stronger execution from our associates, greater resiliency in procedure volumes as healthcare facilities managed both COVID and non-COVID patients and higher acuity resulted in both favorable product mix and increased demand for several product lines. Keep in mind though, that some of the, our business segments are still operating below pre-COVID volume levels. Second, our COVID diagnostic revenues were higher than expected. This included not only Verador revenues, but also MAX and swab and transport revenues. Lastly, we estimated about 100 million in revenues were attributable to stocking and timing. As COVID-19 surges were occurring, we observed some of our customers moving to more of a just-in-case level of inventory and maintaining higher levels of our critical need products on hand. We also saw some of our UK customers buying more ahead of Brexit. The 100 million includes higher than expected revenues in our MMS infusion systems business due to COVID-19. BD medical revenues totaled nearly $2.3 billion and grew 6.9% on an FX neutral basis. Our outperformance was primarily in medication delivery solutions, as well as in medication management solutions. MDS revenues were up 5.6%, while hospital utilization remains below pre-COVID levels and has been an ongoing headwind, we benefited from the acuity of care associated with the treatment of COVID patients. We saw increased demand for PICs, vascular prep and maintenance. As I mentioned, we believe stocking of critical need products helped the quarter. Finally, as expected, there was 37 million in revenues associated with COVID vaccination syringes and needles. Now turning to our MMS business, revenues grew 8.4% with growth in both medication dispensing and infusion systems. In dispensing, we had strong growth internationally and once again exited the quarter with strong committed contracts in the U.S. In Infusion Systems, we continue to support U.S. customers' response during the pandemic under medical necessity and experience another quarter of strong demand in Europe. In diabetes care, revenue growth of 5.4% was above our expectations, reflecting distributor inventory stocking in addition to an easy comparison to last year. We still view this business to be more of a flattish business on a normalized basis. Farm system sales remain strong, growing 9.5%, driven by ongoing demand for our market-leading pre-filled syringe portfolio. BD Life Science revenues totaled nearly $2 billion and were up 74.1% on 
on an FX neutral basis. As I mentioned previously, COVID diagnostic revenues were $867 million in the quarter. Excluding COVID diagnostic revenues, BD life science revenues were down 2.4%, which was better than we expected. Integrated diagnostic solution revenues increased by 106% due to COVID-19 diagnostic testing revenues. Excluding these COVID diagnostic tested revenues, IDS revenues were down just 1.2%. There were several puts and takes in the base business. We saw a stronger than expected performance in our specimen management, blood culture, and women's health and cancer product lines. We also saw some element of distributor stocking of critical to healthcare testing. However, while we have seen improvements, routine diagnostic testing activities are not fully back to pre-COVID-19 levels, and a significantly lighter flu season negatively impacted the base revenue growth in the quarter on a year-over-year -year basis. Now, turning to biosciences, revenue declined by 5.2%, due to a difficult comparison as a result of prior year licensing revenue. In addition, clinical and research activities are not yet fully back to pre-COVID-19 levels. Overall, operational performance in biosciences was better than expected. BD interventional revenues totaled nearly $1.1 billion and were up 5% on an FX uh, neutral basis, with all business units posting growth. We observed that elective procedures, particularly those conducted in an outpatient setting, had greater resiliency in Q1 compared to the initial wave of COVID. This was likely driven by processes and care settings that enabled elective procedures to continue despite the resurgence and a greater willingness on the part of patients to attend to their scheduled elective procedures. Surgery sales were up 1.3%, as strong sales growth in our infection prevention business was offset by the ongoing headwinds related to lower procedures due to the pandemic. Peripheral intervention sales were up 5.9%. Growth was driven by strong performance across our peripheral arterial disease platforms. Urology and critical care turned in another quarter of strong growth with revenues up 8%. Purewick continues to fuel the growth in our acute urology franchise, while our new connected Arctic Sun system is driving double-digit growth in our targeted temperature management business. This is another example of BD leveraging our digital capabilities and broad EMR interoperability footprint to bring new innovations to market. Now, turning to the P&L, we were really pleased with our gross margin performance in the quarter. Our adjusted gross margins were 58.2%, which expanded 170 basis points year over year on a reported basis. On an FX neutral basis, our gross margin expanded 250 basis points, which was primarily driven by COVID diagnostics and higher acuity products. While SSG and A and R&D spending were both higher on a year over year basis, the level of spending was lower than we anticipated, particularly R&D, reflecting mainly timing. Operating margins were 31.6%, up 830 basis points on an FX neutral basis, which was driven by higher gross margins and reduced SG&A and R&D spending. Net interest expense was 118 million, down slightly on a sequential basis. Other income was 30 million versus 27 million a year ago. And the adjusted tax rate came in at 14.6%, which was in line with our expectations. Our adjusted non-GAAP EPS were $4.55. In fiscal Q1, the preferred shares are dilutive. Therefore, in calculating the adjusted non-GAAP EPS, the preferred dividends amount of 23 million was excluded from the numerator, while the diluted share count would be adjusted to include the dilutive impact of the convertible preferred shares and would be 299.1 million. As we've been discussing, our BD 2025 strategy includes a focus on driving cash flow, and we were really pleased with the continued progress of these initiatives and our cash flow performance. We generated 1.5 billion in cash flow from operations in the quarter and 1.3 billion in free cash flows. We, we have also been focused on strengthening our balance sheet. As we previously communicated, we paid down 265 million of debt in the first fiscal quarter. 
Our net leverage ratio declined to 2.5 times as of December 31st, 2020, from 3.0 times at the end of September 2020. A few weeks ago, Moody's upgraded our credit to an investment grade rating, and we are committed to maintaining a full investment grade credit rating across the major credit rating agencies. We believe we're approaching a turning point in our capital allocation. In the past, a significant amount of our cash was dedicated to repaying the debt, but looking ahead, we expect to have greater flexibility to refocus our cash deployment on growth opportunities, including tuck-in M&A, and other capital deployment options. Next, I want to address fiscal 2021 guidance. While we observed greater resiliency in Q1 as it relates to procedure volumes, we still view COVID-19 resurgences to be a significant risk factor to our forward outlook, as it could impact general healthcare utilization, procedure volumes, and diagnostic testing, including COVID testing. In the latter weeks of December, as the resurgences picked up, we started to see pressure on some of our procedure-based products. This trend continued into January. We have updated our guidance to incorporate some impact from the resurgence into our forecast for fiscal Q2, and we continue to monitor the trends. Our guidance continues to assume no major system-wide shutdowns of elective procedures. Now, given the strength of our Q1 performance, along with our outlook for the remainder of the fiscal year, we are comfortable forecasting FX neutral revenue growth in the range of 10 to 12 percent, compared to our prior range of high single to low double digits. This would include our assumption of Veritor revenues being toward the high end of our original guidance range of 1 to 1.5 billion. Using current exchange rates, we expect FX to add approximately 200 basis points to revenue growth versus our prior guidance of about 100 basis points. We expect our non-GAAP EPS for fiscal 2021 to be in the range of 1275 to 1285, which is above our prior guidance range of 1240 to 1260, a raise of 30 cents at the midpoint of the range. So for these reasons, while we are extremely pleased with our strong execution in fiscal Q1, we want to caution against extrapolating our fiscal Q1 revenue margin and EPS performance going forward. While we are not giving quarterly guidance, we thought it might be helpful to provide some context on this quarter's strength as you contemplate phasing for the rest of the year. Our Q1 revenues, operating margins, and adjusted EPS are likely to be the highest absolute levels for the year due to two factors, Veritor pricing and the ramp of our planned investment spending. In addition, the stocking of $100 million will unwind in the remainder of the year. As Tom mentioned, we expect Veritor revenues in fiscal Q2 to be lower than Q1. As we've discussed in the past, we expected our COVID test pricing to decline, and this is playing out. We expect Veritor to be well positioned for broad access as we look ahead. Regarding our operating margins, our fiscal Q1 EPS benefited from the higher Veritor revenues and margin profile, as well as the timing of investment spending. We expect investment spending, particularly in R&D, to be meaningfully step up in Q2. The combination of these two factors will result in our operating margins moving into the low to mid-20s in our fiscal Q2. In the second half of the year, given our expectations for lower Veritor revenues and for investment spending to continue to ramp at a similar rate to fiscal Q2, we would expect operating margins in the low 20s. We're also seeing some impact from the resurgence in January, and like many others, we are also continuing to see pressure from higher shipping costs, as well as some other headwinds. However, due to the strength of our Q1 results, we're able to offset these headwinds and raise our full year EPS guidance. With that, I'll turn it back to Kristen, who will help moderate our Q&A. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, and with that, I'm gonna open it up uh, to the operator, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie, could you please read the instructions? The floor is now open for questions. At this time, if you have a question or comment, please press star followed by one on your touchtone phone. If at any point your question is answered, you may remove yourself from queue by pressing the pound key. In order to allow for broad participation, please limit your questions to one and one follow-up. We ask that while you pose your question, you please pick up your handset to provide optimal sound quality. Thank you. 
Our first question is coming from David Lewis from Morgan Stanley. Oh, good morning, and thanks for taking the questions, and congrats on a nice start to the year. Um, just two for me, uh, uh, team. So first is just um, – Earnings reconciliation, Chris. You know, obviously beat by more than a buck fifty, raised by thirty cents, and I know you gave some parameters there. But we had pricing reductions in our model. We had twenty percent reinvestment of that upside in the model. Even when you make those kind of adjustments, as well as stocking, it's still a little hard to reconcile the upside in the quarter relative to the guide. So I appreciate it's a, a less visible environment. But is there anything else? Uh, is that investment going higher? Um, or anything else we may not be thinking about that would explain uh, why we're not getting this sort of that pull through into, into second, third quarter, because I think that's going to be the key question uh, this morning of the call. Sure, David. Uh, thanks for the question. And I would say, you know, first of all, it's early in the year, obviously. So we're raising, uh, but some of the factors that you mentioned we do see uh, playing out in, in the remainder of the year. So we had a few things going on. Obviously, we mentioned that Veritor, we would expect that revenue to come down in the remainder of the year uh, and moderate, as we talked about. Uh, we also had timing in the base business that we would expect to moderate. And to your point, we do expect the investment spending, both in the, the Veritor reinvestment program that we've discussed, as well as R&D uh, and, uh, and quality, uh, to ramp. So, you know, we started those programs in Q1, uh, you know, we watched those, that spending with some prudence as we, as we looked at the pandemic playing out. Um, and so, you know, we, we got started, but the ramp really comes in the second, third, and, and fourth quarter. Um, and so when you put all of that into context, you also have to take into consideration a little bit of, of impact uh, from the resurgence that we saw that we mentioned we have playing out in Q2. So with all of those factors coming into play, uh, we felt that the, it was prudent to, to think about the guidance that we gave as, as appropriate at this point. Hey, David, this okay. is but, Tom, and, and Chris, good morning, and thanks for the comments. Uh, just to, to reiterate what Chris mentioned, that other topic is, is that we still are in the middle of a pandemic. We want to be prudent. Right? We did see some increases on impacts in procedure volumes in this late December and throughout January. It was certainly less than what we had seen earlier in the pandemic but there are new strains in underway, et cetera. And when we gave guidance at the beginning of the year, we said it excluded right, the impact of a resurgence. Well, there's been a resurgence, and we've been navigating that very well and, and have actually are raising our, our outlook in the middle of a resurgence. So um, we'll continue to evaluate as, as things go forward, but we're certainly pleased with how we started the year. Okay, so the stated factors you've mentioned, but we're not missing anything, uh, it, it, it doesn't sound like. Um, Okay. Um, the second question for you, maybe Tom, more strategic. You know, this is obviously going to be a very good year. We'll see significant upside. The balance sheet's obviously in dramatically better shape now than it was a year ago. As you think about 2022, Tom, how are you thinking about you know, the durability uh, of COVID testing? I know it's a challenging question. And then you know, the ability to sort of manage through uh, what's likely going to be sort of a volatile or, or void-driven earnings period as you head into 22. And how, how are you thinking about sort of 22 and beyond COVID-wise and sort of uh, managing the earnings process? Thanks so much. Yeah, I'll start on that, and then I'll turn it to Chris as well to share some, some comments. Let me maybe focus on specifically COVID testing, and then Chris can make some broader comments on, on uh, the, the broader business. And we've shared, by the way, in the past, we still remain very confident and, and expect our revenues, excluding COVID diagnostic testing, and the Laris pump revenues to grow in those mid-single digits on an FX neutral basis for 22, and that remains our aim and, and our expectation. In, in terms of COVID testing as we go into 22, certainly, as I had shared you know, before, as we got into COVID rapid testing in last July, obviously, we, we didn't have a high expectation that there would be much testing in 22. And as kind of each quarter has gone through, has passed, you know, since that launch in July, we've said we're feeling more confident there's going to be some level of testing in FY22, and, and that certainly remains the case. I think what you know, one of the ways to think about as our capacity has gone up in the space, as we recognize the new strains coming in the market, as antigen testing continues to increase in its um, receptivity and, and people understand now the value in increasing ways of, of getting a test result in 15 minutes, um, you saw us take some actions this quarter to get pricing in, in that low to mid-teen level, which we think will be 
you know, more actually position us well to, to, as I said, to maintain a leadership position for whatever market continues to evolve going into FY22, right? That's part of the thinking. Where the actual market ends up in 22, I, I don't know at this point in time. I, there definitely should be some level of testing. And our aim is to make sure that we're positioned um, to be a leader in however that testing evolves. And, and other things that we're investing in as well, be it our combination assay, which is progressing well in our pipeline, the flu COVID assay, or our exploration of home testing are all aimed with that thought in mind as well. So maybe Chris, just um, maybe some broader comments on FY22. Yeah. So yes, I, I, you know, obviously we're not going to go through 22 with any level of precision, but I think it is important to, to give some high level comments uh, on it. And as you know, Tom mentioned, uh, the level of COVID testing is a, a variable that, that will uh, have a big impact on 22. We do see the sustainability of testing, but at what level it's really hard to, to guess at this point. You know, in addition, there's a lot of other uncertainty, you know, around COVID in general, uh, the resurgences, mutations, the uptake of the vaccines. Uh, and in our business, obviously, Alaris and, and when that comes back in 22 uh, will have an impact. Uh, I would remind you that on our November call, we, we said we expected our revenues, excluding COVID diagnostic testing and the Alaris pump revenues, to grow in mid-single digits on an FX neutral basis. And we continue to see that as a reasonable assumption. Uh, we can't predict when the FDA clearance for Alaris and our focus on um, making a comprehensive filing to support a timely approval is, is, is there, but we would expect some clearance sometime in fiscal 22. Uh, we'd also not look at the second half of 21 as a proxy of what to expect in 22, because both the gross and operating margins are impacted by, by several factors. Uh, our operating margin in fiscal 21 reflects these incremental investments we're making as part of the reinvestment program of Veritor that really helps drive durable growth aligned with our 2025 strategy. And we don't expect those investments to, to continue into 22, so they'll, you know, exit, exiting 21, uh, they'll roll off and we, that should help margins going into 22. Um, the other thing I'd point out is that Q1 fiscal 22 will obviously be the most difficult comp from a margin perspective, uh, given the very strong quarter we just reported. Uh, for example, most likely uh, face the most difficult comparison with COVID uh, revenues, as well as uh, from the impact of the timing and stocking that we talked about. So uh, we would expect our operating margin to compress year over year from the 31.6% that we just achieved. So we'll update you more on our thoughts on, on 22 as we progress the year, but we just thought it's important to provide some of those uh, highlights. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, Dave, we feel really good about the, the progress of our strategy overall and the underlying business momentum that we continue to, to build upon. So thanks okay. for the question. Thanks so much for the detail. Thank you. Your next question comes from Robbie Marcus with J.P. Morgan. Hey, Robbie. Oh, good great. Morning uh, good morning. Congrats on a good quarter also, and, and thanks for taking the question. Um, I wanted to uh, touch on, you know, on, on one of the slides in the back, you have that the underlying basis ex-COVID grew 4% in the quarter, which was a really healthy rate. How are you thinking about that base business ex-COVID growth uh, through the, the cadence of the year here. You know, that's a pretty healthy start in what was a tough quarter. How should we think about that component of the business uh, throughout fiscal 21? Okay. Thanks, Robbie. I'll let Chris answer that. Yeah, I think, you know, one way to think about that is what I mentioned about 22 is that we expect the base business to be uh, ramping at a, at a uh, mid-single digit. So uh, that's consistent with that. So I think that we feel the the underlying business is, is solidly in, in that kind of perspective. Um, and, you know, as we, we talked about the base business, we expect to be kind of in that low to mid single digit uh, uh, level for, you know, for the full year. And so there is some pressures in the second half of the year on a, uh, a business by business basis. As you think about MMS, there will be some uh, uh, issues. It's going to be lumpy you know, in the remaining quarters. Uh, MMS had, you know, a significant amount of revenue in the third quarter during the pandemic last year. Other parts of the business will, will ramp nicely. Um, 
you know, China, for example, as we uh, lap the the COVID impact that, you know, really was in Q2 there, uh, you know, in China. So, you know, we'll start seeing some revenue growth uh, from that. Uh, but again, that's more of a compare. It's not, you know, an indication of the underlying business. But the underlying business really is in that low to mid single digit uh, basis. You know, we have some general uh, issues with compare to the, based on the Alara ship hold, some of that's been negated by medical necessity. So, you know, there's a number of factors going on. But the, the bottom line of it all is think about the base business, you know, for the remainder of this year in that low to mid single digits and exiting into 22 in the mid single digit basis. Okay, thank you, Robbie. Great. Uh, maybe just a, a quick follow up. You're, you're generating a pretty significant amount of cash here. Um, you, you got the balance sheet in a great spot last year uh, when things were looking uh, pretty down for COVID, and, and now things are looking up. Uh, so how are you approaching the uses of these, this cash, uh, particularly as we go into next year? And you know, to follow up on the last question, there, there is a uh, you know, question mark about how to bridge some of the earnings. You know, what, what are you thinking about uses of cash, M&A opportunities across the business, and, and how much of that might get returned to shareholders? Thanks. Yeah, Rob, Robbie, I'll start with it and, and turn it over to Chris for some further details. Obviously, from uh, you see us investing behind our growth strategy. You see us making investments in capacity, for example, capacity investments in uh, rapid testing, capacity investments in helping the uh, vaccination campaigns, whether or not that's with needles and syringes or the, the, you know, the billion two investment you saw us uh, announced last quarter uh, related to, uh, to our pharmaceutical systems, pre-fillable devices. So we're going to continue to invest in growth. Part of that investing for growth is also our tuck in M&A strategy, and you saw us begin to accelerate our efforts in that uh, last quarter. You're seeing that continue into this fiscal year, and, and you heard me mention we have a robust funnel to continue that. We remain very focused with an emphasis on tuck-in M&A, as, as I've been iterating since uh, transitioning in, into the role that I'm in today. Um, you know, as we think about more broad deployment of, of capital uh, to create shareholder value, maybe Chris, comment on that? Sure, absolutely. And, and I would just say a few things first. Uh, you know, we were very proud of the fact that we really focused on cash during the pandemic. And, and if you look back, in fact, at the third quarter, of last year, our cash flow actually increased year over year, despite the fact uh, that the revenues were suppressed from, from COVID. And that was the result of a number of actions that we took in the business around inventories, receivables, payables. Um, and so we're very proud of that. We really focused on cash. Uh, as we mentioned at your conference uh, last month, Robbie, you know, we paid down uh, $265 million of debt. That kind of gets us down to the target. So we see the, um, the leverage ratio floating down naturally without the need to, to pay down debt, which really says that the, you know, the $5 billion-ish that we've paid down debt over the last couple of years, that strong cash flow that we're generating uh, will be available to, to uh, allocate to, to uh, other value enhancements. So, you know, we've talked about primarily the tuck-in M&A and share repurchase uh, and as we get through this pandemic and as that safety net of cash that we've had, uh, you know, to ride out the pandemic isn't as necessary, we'll have the ability towards the end of this year. And you've seen our, you know, our tuck in M&A ramping up. The pipeline is good. We continue to look at a number of opportunities. And, you know, by the end of this year, I think we'll be also talking about, uh, you know, giving that cash back to shareholders because once we get through this period, we don't see the need to, you know, build up cash on the balance sheet. And so we would be returning that to shareholders, um, you know, after a, a certain amount of, of tuck in M&A. So it, this puts us in a very good position. We've got great cash flow generation um, and better than ever. And, you know, that puts us in a great position uh, to allocate that appropriately. And we continue, just as Chris mentioned, these are all programs with momentum. Um, you know, we have a cash committee that meets uh, basically every week, and, and we continue to have teams dedicated to that work. So uh, appreciate the recognition there, Robbie, and, and uh, we're going to continue that focus. And I, I think that recognition also came, you know, from Moody's. Uh, we felt really good about the fact that they upgraded us to investment grade. In fact, not only did they upgrade us 
but they kept the positive outlook, which uh, we really appreciated as well. And so that puts us full investment grade across all three uh, rating agencies, and we, we fully intend to stay that way. Thanks for the question. Operator? As a reminder, please limit yourself to one question. Your next question comes from the line of Vijay Kumar with Evercore ISI. Good morning, Vijay. Hey guys. Good morning, Vijay. Good m morning, guys, and congrats on a solid print here, Tom. Uh, so maybe um, I'll, I'll limit to one question, perhaps a two-parter. Um, on on uh, the revenue guidance, Tom, um, did anything change out of um, outside of um, you know uh, the Veritor, uh, you know, coming in at the high end? And the reason I ask is, you guys just did 680 in Q1. The guide of one and a half implies a pretty drastic fall off uh, in Veritor revenues in the back half. Uh, and Chris, uh, the margins here, I think, uh, would imply a sub 25% off margins for. Um, uh, 2Q to uh, 4Q to get to the guide. Um, you know that that's below your uh, pre-pandemic levels. I'm I'm curious um, if there are any incremental expenses in the back half. Thank you. Hey VJ, and, and nice approach with a two-part one question. Um, so on on the uh, the revenue side on on Veritor. So I, I think the key thing to to, men, to to talk about there is the pricing comment that I made is, is one big piece that drives that. Right? We said we were above 20. In the last quarter, and you know, we're, as we think about looking forward, we talked about modeling low to mid teens. So that that's the number one uh, adjustment there. And again, we've been that's not new news at all. Than the fact that we've been talking about that we expect pricing to head that in, in that level as our capacity comes online and we're in a better cost positions, et cetera, and as more capacity is coming into the marketplace. And uh, so we've taken actions as planned, and and that is why we gave guidance that said expect the revenues to be highly weighted to the first half of the year, and we've, we've said that from day one. I think the, there remains uncertainty around the, the effectiveness and timing of the vaccines, especially with, with um, you know, additional variants that are out there, et cetera, but we, we can't predict what's going to happen there on, on the second half of the year, and so we remain projecting that um, there will be very strong demand for antigen testing um, you know, in the first half of the year, and that the second half of the year is is uh, less certain. Obviously, if if demand stays very high, and depending on the the uh, dynamics with capacity and and demand and how those curves cross over, you know, maybe there could be up opportunity in the back half of the year. But it's way too early to, to, for us to think about that as because uh, it's far from certain or uh, able to be confirmed. So um, our aim is to position ourselves to be a leader in the space, uh, however it ends up evolving. And uh, as we go forward, there'll, there'll be more clarity there, but certainly, certainly a very dynamic environment. Um, maybe, Chris, yeah. on part two? Sure. On uh, margins, VJ, you know, Q1 margins were obviously very, very strong. And that was a function of a number of things. First, you know, the COVID testing, obviously. But the base business was very, very strong as well. And we drove some, you know, synergy uh, and uh, continuous improvement kind of margin improvements as well. So all things... Uh, were uh, positive in, in Q1. As we think about the rest of the year, you would expect that COVID testing to moderate as you model that out, obviously. And then don't forget, you also have the unwind of, of the timing that we saw of the 100 million in Q1. That, that unwinds in the remainder of the year. But the most important thing is the ramping of investments uh, that we've discussed. So we're investing in R&D, we're investing in quality, we're investing in, in uh, the Veritor reinvestment uh, program, and all of those things kind of ramp in Q2, Q3, and Q4. And so don't think about that as, you know, an indication of our pre-pandemic margins. It's just completely different. And then, you know, those investments go away into 22. The beauty of it is they, they begin to drive, you know, improvements in, in growth and, and, you know, revenue generation, in margin, you know, expansion, and those things will kick in uh, towards the latter half of, of FY22. So, you know, they, they you get to pick up in margins by them going away, and then the benefit of those those investments in driving revenue growth and, and margin improvement going forward. Uh, so, you know, it's you you can't look at that as you know, well, those are different than pre-pandemic uh, margins. So. Uh, that's the way to think about, you know, 21 as it as it plays out. 
Thanks, guys. Your next question is from Bob Hopkins with Bank of America. Oh, thanks for taking the question, and, and good morning. Um, I'll morning, Bob. To, morning. I'll just stick to one topic, um, especially, uh, Tom, since you mentioned it's here, still your number one priority. On, on Alaris refiling, um, are you guys just waiting on FDA at this point, or is there more work that, B need, that BD needs to do? And if there's more work, you know, what still needs to be done? I'm um, just looking for a, a little bit more detailed update there. Thank you. Sure. And thanks, Bob, and, and, and good to connect. So as I mentioned, we remain on track for the uh, submission in, in late fiscal Q2 or, or early Q3, and, and we're not waiting on anything specific from, from the FDA. These are, are very comprehensive um, submissions, right? I think 1,000-plus you know, page you know, filings that, uh, that take time to prepare and have a lot of comprehensive data in them. And so right, we've always said from the start our, our focus isn't – uh, in rushing into a submission, but it's around ensuring a comprehensive submission that is going to achieve our ultimate goal, which is a timely FDA review and clearance. And so, you know, that that remains our focus on from that perspective. Obviously, you know, Q2, Q3 is is uh, coming up upon us here. The teams are making great progress, and we continue to iterate uh, that timeline. We'll continue as we have in the past. Um, as we get to that date, those dates, um, we'll provide updates at, at public conferences or, or um, as, as appropriate. So, Okay, so it's, it's not that everything is into the agency and you're just waiting to hear back from them. You guys are still putting the, the, the package together to, to, to submit. Correct. You can expect that once we submit, we'll, we'll communicate um, that in an appropriate form. But uh, we haven't, we're, we're preparing to submit in, in the timeline that I mentioned. Great. Thanks very much. Yep. Your next question is from Richard Nowitter with SVB Newer Inc. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> just given that you're clearly accelerating uh, Tuck and M&A uh, at, 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 from the capital redeployment standpoint, at, 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 which makes a ton of sense, especially with the COVID windfall and your free cash flow generation, should we be thinking about the contribution for what you might do um, on a more aggressive kind of M&A front going forward as maybe bringing you more towards kind of a upper mid single digit kind of growth profile or even maybe high single digits. I'm just trying to think through the, 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 the shift in the reprioritization here, clearly more aggressive, more on offense. Is that, is that where we're headed once we return to a more normalized environment? Thanks. Okay. Th thanks for your question. Obviously, our, our number one focus is on durable mid-single-digit revenue growth, and, and, and that's our, our, our aim here. And so we really see, um, in, I, we often refer to it inside as inorganic innovation. We look at our, our pipeline. We look at the market spaces that we participate in. I, I walk through three of our, our three key areas of innovation focus um, earlier in the call, and we evaluate constantly what products and initiatives we can fund organically and, and drive in-house to advance that strategy and, and create shareholder value and value for patients and, and, and providers. And we also are constantly looking at the, the external landscape as well to see how uh, what may be out there that uh, could get the market sooner than we could or maybe has some great talent that created some really exciting innovations um, outside of, of BD that we can bring, bring in-house. And so we're going to continue to do that, but it, it's all in line with, um, I'd say, a more holistic approach to driving that, that durable mid-single-digit uh, revenue growth profile that, uh, that, that people really um, that have come to appreciate from, from BD. Thanks for the question. Your next question comes from the line of Brian Weinstein with William Blair. Hey guys, good morning. Thanks for morning. taking the question. Hey Brian, just, good morning. Hey, um, just 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 some uh, some things on, on Veritor. Um, can, can you just talk about your capacity now? And you mentioned making additional investments in, in testing. So, um, where would that in um, uh, uh, capacity there? Where would that get you? And how, just how to reconcile the capacity expansion um, that you're going through with the thoughts on the slowdown in demand? How, how do I reconcile this? Is this also about building? for at-home testing, and you tease some thoughts on exploration there. Can you just tell me what that means? Thanks. 
Sure, Brian, and, and uh, good, good to connect as always. So the capacity is as we've communicated in, in the past, right, that we are at uh, going to 12 million tests in March is, is what we communicated on our last earnings call. Um, and we're on track for that. And we're also on track for the, the max capacity expansion that we had described before. Now, I don't think it's a, a, a fair thing to say that we continue to sell all of that capacity as we look forward. That's not known to us particularly in the, in the back half of, of the year. But we're positioned, um, you know, this is a global pandemic that's going on in the world as we think about opening up uh, businesses and, and schools and other things. People are going to look at what different types of testing technology they can use, and, and our aim is to make sure that, that things are available to healthcare systems as, as needed. So we're doing that. Um, and we've also shared, right, we're, we're actually depreciating those assets within the year so that as things unfold in 22 and 23, those assets won't be burdened on our, on our P&L because we're able to, to fund that within the profits that are generated uh, within this, this fiscal year. So that, that's, that's our approach. Um, you know, nothing more than that. We, uh, at this point, we probably don't want to comment more on the home space other than to mention that we are actively exploring that, um, has, been, has been our practice um, as we advance uh, our, our work in, in that and the combination assays that uh, we've shared that are in development. We'll really end up sharing more about those as we actually um, gain EUA and, and uh, head towards launch if, uh, if those occur. So I think that's it. Maybe we do have Dave Hickey on the phone. Um, I, I can pause. And, and Dave, I don't know if there's any other comments to add from you. No, I mean, uh, Brian, hi. It's, uh, I mean, Tom, you've captured it eloquently. I think capacity, you know, we've moved to 12 million tests uh, per month from next month. You mentioned max. So max, actually, we did increase capacity to 1.9 million tests uh, per month for the molecular assay from, you know, from, from last month, actually. And there are a variety of additional topics like uh, the, you know, claims, home testing, OTC that we're exploring right now, as well as additional menu to, to leverage the 70,000 plus operators that are going to be out there. And, uh, you know, as that, you know, as those decisions take place, we'll, we'll share more details as, as we get, as we get those decisions. Yeah. And those markets still are not well defined today, uh, as you know, Brian. So thank you for the question. Thanks. Your next question comes from Larry Bigelson with Wells Fargo. Uh, good morning. morning Thanks for taking the question. Morning. Hey, just morning, one Larry. for me on, uh, you have, morning, Tom. You have the uh, BTK panel coming up on February 17th. Um, um, as you guys know, that tends to get outsized attention, um, you know, by uh, investors. So it sounds like uh, you guys requested the panel. What, what do you think the, you know, hot topics or key issues are going to be? Every Every panel has them. You know, do you expect FDA, you know, uh, and the panel to debate, you know, whether it should be six-month efficacy, you know, that's the focus, or 12-month data, your level of confidence, you know, in the outcome, and, and do you still see this as kind of a $150 million opportunity, which is kind of what Bard, you know, thought it was, uh, you know, before the acquisition? Thanks for taking the question. Thanks, Larry, and, and, and good que great question. Um, let me maybe make a short comment here, and then we have Simon uh, Campion on, on the phone, and, and we'll turn it over to him, who's obviously much, uh, who's deeply versed in, in this. Is um, so. First off, just as a reminder, we have nothing in our forward-looking plan for BTK uh, approval, right? Um, it's not in our 21 plan, and it's in no forward-looking outlook that we have as we think about how we model things within the company. Um, today, Lutonix revenues are less than one percent of our overall BD revenue, and, and this indication specifically, again, is not included in our, in our forecast. You know, as we go into the panel, and Simon will share more detail in this. The one thing that we have is we know this is a highly underserved market, and we know that our clinical trial data shows very strongly that it's safe. That Lutonix is safe in this patient population. I think it's the first product that's gone through a trial in the U.S. that has the ability to do that. Now the question is. Um, are the clinical outcomes that were shown in our trial sufficient enough for it to be warranted for an approval? And so, Simon, let me turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, so, you know, uh, as Tom just reiterated, the, the safety profile of, of, of uh, DCBs and the BTK in particular has been, I think, has been um, has been well discussed, and the data that we're providing is, is demonstrating continued safety of of, uh, of the Lutonix product. Um, in relation to, um, yeah, we we did uh, request the uh, the panel meeting as you as you know, 
um, you know, below the knee uh, patients uh, with uh, with critical limb ischemia um, are, are you know are, are in a in a very bad way. It's the most serious form of peripheral, peripheral arterial disease. They have multiple comorbidities, uh, and you know some of the 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 most important things uh, for this patient population uh, are are a, are a options uh, and b an opportunity to to expand the the gap between uh, between these frequent interventions that that they will have. So. As we move into panels, certainly there will be a debate uh, around the uh, around the clinical data that uh, that we have uh, that we've acquired. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, you know, it, this is a, this is another tool uh, in the armamentarium of um, of tools that uh, clinicians have for for BTK interventions. If you if you think back to 20 years ago and SFA or popliteal intervention, uh, there were there were PTA balloons and off label uh, off label stents. Um, uh, and today, there's a, there's a wide range of technology available to them, all, all the way up to drug color balloons and drug eluding stents. Uh, but in BTK today, uh, as, as I said, the most serious form of peripheral arterial disease, there is one product available, and that's PTA. So we're not suggesting this is the uh, the silver bullet for all BTK patients. We're suggesting that this is a, another tool that can enhance the uh, outcomes for for different patients uh, and equip physicians to uh, to assess each and every patient. Uh, and have a yet another tool uh, to um, to treat them with. So uh, the panel's on um, February the 17th. Uh, we've gone through uh, you know, comprehensive preparation for it, uh, and we'll absolutely put our best foot forward on that date to uh, convince the panel of the merits of our application. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. Your next question is from Larry Cush with Raymond James. Hey, good morning, Larry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, so Tom, I wanted to just touch on uh, the investment spend that you guys um, talked uh, a lot about, and certainly you've, you've really amped up the conversation around that over the past couple quarters, and I guess I'm really focused in on the R&D side of things. Um, I feel like I've heard this story uh, in the past here at BD, um, and, and, and you know, there's been some challenges with, with innovation and really getting, you know, products out onto the market that were considered to be more than just evolutionary. Um, so I, I get the sense that things are probably different this time around, but I'm just trying to understand, you know, if there's a new approach or are you investing differently or anything that you can kind of speak to to, to help us get comfortable that, that these investments, you know, hopefully can lead to visible uh, new product introductions. Sure, Larry. Yeah, good and, and, and fair question. So a couple, let me start with just overall R&D effectiveness, and, and I can get a little bit of color on the types of initiatives that we're investing in here and, uh, and also how we think about our overall innovation system. So um, as you know, uh, John DeFord joined us as our chief technology officer uh, about three years ago. And uh, really, under his leadership, there's been tremendous progress uh, within the organization and, and, and with the segment teams and the business teams in, in advancing our um, ability to, to drive innovation. Actually, over that time period, you know, we've gone from kind of the, you know, the, the midpoint of, of not being where we wanted in terms of on-time milestone delivery or on-time launches to being... Um, as we benchmark ourselves to being in the top quartile within the industry of, of hitting our, our milestones and, and most importantly, hitting our launches, right? Our launches are now you know, about 80 plus percent of, of our launches are, are on time, um, which is, is up very notably over the last three years, um, up over 30 percentage points or around 30 percentage points, in, in fact. So you know, we, we see the progress being made, and that's, that's a result of, of a lot of uh, system improvements, new capabilities brought in, um, taking some of the best practices actually from BARD and, and the acquisition and, uh, and, and applying those uh, across the company. So that's, that's something we're going to continue to, uh, to build upon. As we think about the innovations that we're investing in, it, you know, as we, we look at those, there's not um, – there's few, as I think about them, kind of – new to world innovations that, that are in our, in our pipeline. I mean, one of some of the ones we've already talked about, right? Non-COVID menu expansion on Veritor and Max to take it, you know, to capitalize on our expanded footprint. We have a strong track record of developing new assays on Max and, and, uh, and Veritor, right? It's just examples of that. Other initiatives are accelerating programs that we already had in our pipeline and allowing them to 
to uh, come to market, you know, a year or two earlier than we originally projected. That's an area of investment that we're making. And there are a number of areas in, in each of the segments which we're um, accelerating um, new products into the pipeline, but they're all very much in line with our strategy and, and areas that we're confident that we have internal capabilities in. Of course, what we are also doing that's complementing that is that tuck-in M&A strategy that I mentioned before. And we, we do think about often, and, and we'll have those discussions internally, if technologies are better developed in-house or that we should be going outside because we have um, we don't have those capabilities in-house. And, and we'll either look at do they exist today in, in someone else's pipeline and is that a, an opportunity for tuck-in M&A or do we need to be doing collaborations with uh, with outside groups and many of there's many R&D programs that we have today I think probably a record level of R&D programs where we have external partnerships in place um, you know actually the BD core would be one that I mentioned before we're very strong external partnerships with the robotics because um, that's a very advanced automation system um, and, and so we've brought in you know, robotic experts that, that helped us with that launch, and it's going really well in Europe, and we're bringing it to the U.S. here, but that's one that we probably wouldn't have been able to develop in the same way if we had tried to do it on our own, but we're seeing successes with that approach, and we're seeing it in many other areas as well. So that's kind of maybe just a little bit of color, Larry, and how we think about it overall, but uh, you know, with that progress that we've made and, and the way that we've, we've thought through making these investments and how we also – Think about where it's smarter for us to do tuck and M&A. We're confident in, in those investments. Uh, okay, very good. Thank you for that. Yep. Your next Your question next comes question. from Matt Taylor with UBS. Hi, thank you for taking the question. Um, so I just wanted to ask about the, the Veritor pricing uh, from the standpoint of you know, how that came about. Usually we would think about it as being more of a competitive dynamic, but it seems like from your comments, you're being a little bit more proactive to, to lower price to make it a better value proposition for, you know, stakeholders. And so I wanted to understand, um, A, how that came about, and B, do you expect it to go down further in the future, or do you think this is, you know, a, a, a point of equilibrium? Yeah, good good question, Matt. Um, so, yes, you're right. It, it's a combination of we do we've always said that we believe the pricing would head in this direction our capacity is increasing and we want to be proactive in maintaining that leadership position there is but there is additional capacity coming in the industry now as as well too and there will be further capacity coming in we're not the only company who's adding in capacity and so we think about that you know holistically and where pricing as a result of that is going today and where um, we best position our product to remain a leader in that, and that's how we, we you know, develop it, and we spend a lot of time thinking those things through as to when um, and how we, we optimize our pricing. Again, to also serve what is a continued evolving customer base as, as more non-traditional areas of healthcare get into wanting to do antigen testing and making sure that it's uh, appropriately priced to enable the broadest access to the product, you know, while we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And so right, we've gotten very positive receptivity for the pricing. We already had started, we've already started to roll that out a couple weeks ago, um, last month. And uh, so good question. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Your next question is from Josh Jennings with Cowan. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Hey, Just one. Good morning. Just one quick one on Veritor. Uh, just with the UK and South African variants, I, th I think the UK ran some studies on rapid antigen testing and, and confirmed, confirmed that there was no uh, change in sensitivity or specificity. But if we think about the South African variant and the UK variant and future variants, you know, what is what is Becton doing to just monitor those variants and, and ensure that the, that the sensitivity and specificity aren't altered by, uh, by some of the mutations? And, and the virus and, and the subsequent antigens yeah. that you guys are testing for. Thanks. Yeah, good question, Josh. And, and that's certainly something that our teams are all over. Let me turn it over to Dave Hickey. We've got on the line the, the president of our, our life science segment. Great. Uh, thank you, Tom and, and Josh. Great question. Um, so to your point, you know, there have been obviously several, several newly identified variants uh, reported recently. Um, and there could well be others, right, recognizing that this is a, an RNA virus, very much like uh, influenza and, and HIV that, that are known to mutate. Um, and, you know, for us, we've got two different types of platforms, right? So we've obviously got the BD Veritor antigen test. We've got the BD Max 
uh, molecular PCR tests. So let, let me take Max first. So for BD Max and for the assays that we have on the Max, we've already completed uh, uh, an in silico analysis, which is a computer model based on sequencing. Um, and you know to look at those mutations and from everything that we can see around those mutations um, and the lineage of, of, of the sequence we have no impact on the BD max uh, assays for BD Veritor uh, which is obviously more amino acid based on on the top of the protein based on you know early analysis again there we've no evidence to show that the UK South African and indeed Brazilian variant will have an impact on the test but you know, we continue to take actions to look at that, further confirm, and, and monitor the performance. And, uh, you know, and, and again, we'll, we've done that for the ones that are already out there and any potential new emergent strains. And this is a critical topic for us because, you know, I think the thing to remember here is as these variants come online and, and come out, which are reportedly, you know, more transmissible, it makes the importance of rapid testing and access to testing uh, as important, if not more important than ever. Thanks for the question, Josh. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> there are no further questions at this time. I would like to turn the floor back over to Tom Pollan for closing remarks. Okay. Well, thank you, and, and thanks, obviously, to, uh, to everyone for your questions. Just before we sign off, I would be remiss if I did not thank BD70,000 Associates around the globe who every day rally around our purpose of advancing the world of health. Your efforts and achievements this quarter were noticed. You continue to work tirelessly to make sure that our needed products reach the front line to combat this pandemic while executing on our strategic agenda. I'm proud of how we've started our fiscal 2021, and I'm looking forward to continuing to deliver on our goals of developing innovative devices and making meaningful health impacts to people around the world. On behalf of the entire executive team, thank you for your efforts and sacrifices. Onward we go together, and like you, I'm proud to be BD. Thank you for listening today, and we look forward to connecting at in future investor meetings with everyone who's joined the call. And until then, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. This does conclude today's teleconference. Please disconnect your lines at this time, and have a wonderful day.